as a rhythm and, rhythm and tempo can create a psychological and emotional engagement with the audience. You can go so far as modernizing content and embedding current social issues and anxieties to engage listeners, listeners even further. Radio scholar L.P. Kuhlweiler suggests appreciating radio drama as its own form of artistic expression and moving beyond a focus on fidelity to the source text or applying literary criticism to the oral medium. As Dermot Radigan writes in his study of radio theater, whether a script is written specifically for the radio or adapted from another medium is less important than whether the radio production has made good, creative, and imaginative use of sound elements. Although I've discovered more than two good, creative, and imaginative radio dramas broadcast across time and space and produced outside of the U.S., our time is obviously being limited to just two. So radio broadcast of Carmilla for Columbia Workshop and Sears Radio Workshop creatively used dialogue, uh, voice, dialogue, sound effects, and dramatical, dramatic musical bridges to convey an atmosphere suspended in horror and descriptive and suggestive dialogue and verbal exchanges to emphasize or really to shy away from the seductive eroticism and lesbian elements of the novella. But the 1940s summer broadcast for Columbia Workshop was Bill Fletcher, who's known for producing this script for Sorry Wrong Number in 1948 is featured Agnes Moorhead. And if you've never listened to a radio drama from this period, I encourage you to, to find one online and have a listen. I think you'll enjoy it. So um, what Fletcher does is she contemporizes the text by introducing modern conveniences such as a limo, a telephone. She relocates the setting to an American suburb on Maple Hill and concludes with the death of Helen in this story or original lore, of course, in Carmilla's survival. Fletcher's script alludes to contemporary parental concerns and challenges associated with raising a teen, anxieties over teenage sexuality, the power of negative peer influence, and the dangers inherent in challenging male authority in the form of the parent and the church. Helen's father, Jay Dodge, calls on the family pastor, Reverend, with Reverend Witherspoon, to help him get rid of Carmilla and to save Helen. Witherspoon arrives and visits the ailing Helen's room. Lister's initial introduction to Helen is the sound of her sweet, youthful voice and her repeatedly calling for Carmilla. She sounds innocent. Similarly, Carmilla's introduction as, quote, poor little Carmilla, end quote, and her deceptive, youthful voice suggests she too is a teenager, which differs in the characterization of these women in the, in the later Sears Radio Theater production from 79. Carmilla has cat-like characteristics evident in her vocal purrs, her nightly growling and sleeping in. Carmilla's voice is mature, suggestive, and any suggestion that Helen's feelings for Carmilla might move beyond friendship is eliminated when Helen proclaims the passion flower is a symbol of her love affair with Tony the gardener. Carmilla dismisses this, of course, as silliness. Following the visit of a black cat in her bedroom, Helen begins to waste away. Carmilla's behavior grows more bizarre, such as showing up covered in blood. Dodge observes the changes in his daughter and those of Carmilla's nightly prowling. Dodge accuses Carmilla of sneaking into the village at night and suggests that she, quote, may have a boyfriend or someone she meets down in the village. Otherwise, why would she sneak out at night? This brief exchange alludes to relatable parental, parental fears about adolescent female promiscuity and negative peer influence. Dodge warns Camilla that he has a good mind to turn her over to the police, but he won't, for Helen's sake, if she will leave. So here we can see that what uh, Fletcher's done has created quite a, quite a little domestic drama. His reaction criminalizes Carmilla's behavior, though no crime, not even the epidemic of deaths in the village are, are attributed to her. Dutch clearly has no authority over Carmilla. In fact, she scoffs at his, at his accusation, which elevates his anger. So as we're listening, their verbal exchange becomes loud and it becomes physical. We have the layered sounds of female shrieking and male shouting, enhanced by the sound of a physical altercation, as Dodge is wrestling the letter opener out of Carmilla's hand. And as we also know it, that by this time, Carmilla controls Helen, and she also cruelly taunts Dodge. Didn't she? You thought Helen was sent away. Do you think walls or doors or locks would keep me away from Helen? No, Mr. Dodge, she's mine. She then turns her attention to a sleep, to the sleeping Helen and she says, oh, see how beautifully she sleeps. She's happy now. Do you know what she's dreaming of, Mr. Dodge? I do. So Rolling Thunder at this point interrupts her and Dodge and 
he described seeing Carmilla leap, jump onto Helen's bed, and her teeth bared like the pointed fangs of a wolf. As the episode moves toward its inevitable conclusion, Dodge and Witherspoon locate the coffin of the 300-year-old Mercala, which is a revision of Malarca. Malarca. Opening the coffin, they describe seeing the corpse of a young girl with red hair. So we're left without resolution. Helen dies, and Dodge voices surprise and horror as he sobs that Carmilla is still in the house and ready to solve her next victim. So the voice acting in the 1979 adaptation, which was broadcast on the Sears Radio Theater, um, lacked the conviction of the 1940 version. The Sears Radio Theater was only on the air for about a year, and it was it was sponsored by the Sears and Robot uh, Robot Company. Um, uh, Greater Duffield wrote the script, and film and radio actor Vincent Price hosted this vampire tale and hosted many of the horror tales on this on the anthology series at the time. So in this version, we have Carmilla again is set in the village on the outskirts of Vienna for some reason in 1922, and Carmilla's female victim is named Amy Forrester, who's described as a young lady of quality, and who of course isn't beyond selling her own frocks. Which, of course, is um, obvious, an obvious connection or segue uh, that plays the Sears commercials for the advertisement of household products, such as a Kenmore sewing machine, into the story. With that, we also assume or have an idea that um, the, the audience listening is probably largely female. Based on the sound of the women's voices, there's a clearly an age disparity between Carmilla and Amy which takes a completely different tone than the first version. Amy narrates her encounter with this vampire. She's writing in her diary and in a high-pitched and clear voice uh, that definitely suggests youth and innocence. She is, if she is contrary to Carmilla in age and with her voice, Carmilla's voice is deeper and more mature and also aristocratic. From this narrative, we learn that she's almost 18, that Amy's almost 18, and believes that fate had brought Carmilla to her. In another twist, Carmilla's father knows the Baroness, Carmilla's aunt, from their earlier embassy work, and that's all we find out. The Baroness contacts him by telephone, requesting he take care of her niece, and this first mention of her name, Carmilla's name, um, puts the audience on alert that this woman is uh, dangerous uh, because the mention of her name is punctuated by what, what we call in what, what radio calls a stinger, which is a high discordant note, musical note and pretty standard in radio horror um, and related to you know any kind of horror story really on film as well. Carmilla is described as pretty and as sweet as Amy. Amy's initially flattered by the attention that Carmilla gives her, but she starts <coughs> to be um, to to experience a mix of antipathy, she says, and admiration. While Carmilla describes her friendship as selfish and she fails never to love anyone as much as she loves Amy. She promises to share with Amy a secret really soon, and that's, that's all we hear. They grow closer. Amy's night terrors continue. Um, a fantastic monstrous cat morphs in the shape of a blood so Carmilla, sending Amy into hysteria. Um, and of course, Amy oh, oh, awakens to her dead mother's voice. As, she experiences, as her experiences grow more sinister, listeners grow increasingly uneasy. The moody music, discordant, punctuated musical chords underscore the action. And this uneasiness easy, continues to the last few minutes, and even as listeners are unsure whether the relationship between the woman and the vampire, if they are now friends, if they're lovers, if it's a, if it's a relationship of servant mother daughter, we're not quite sure where they are with their relationship at this point. The women take a taxi and other water to be used to the rooms of the mansion for a picnic, despite warnings that she was not to be alone with Carmilla. Dust settles. Amy suggests returning home, and Carmilla's chilling reply is totally domineering and shockingly matter of fact. Carmilla warns her neither of them is going home, that the ruins are their home now. Amy then describes and is surprised by, describes for us and is surprised by Carmilla's vice like grip of her wrist and the acrid smelling cloth forced over her nose, which suggests that modern medicine, not the vampire's hypnotic power, um, must be used to induce sleep. Amy awakens in a dark chamber with Carmilla sitting next to her and describing seeing the once lovely face of Carmilla twisted in a diabolical grin. The Cronstein tuning echoes with the women's voices, howling winds, dung dripping water, standard tropes of horror, 
Amy Fincher, whether she's dead or alive, Carmilla's smooth, seductive tone underscores the horror of her words and promises that death is happiness and that she will lead Amy to a place of refuge, which is the sleep of the vampire. Amy's hysteria builds as Carmilla reveals that she is a Countess Mercola, a vampire, and promises that before nightfall she will gently drain Helen to the brink. Amy's voice is confused, sad, and slightly hysterical, and we too experiences horror, the same kind of horror and dread when Amy questions their friendship and says, I thought we were friends. And Carmilla says, well, always, you're my companion. I've been seeking you. You've, I've, um, you've seen your last sunrises, and I will keep you alive as a vampire. Tomorrow night, you begin and make your first kill. Amy tearfully pleads to, to, uh, for pity while Carmilla coaxes and soothes her with the words, calling her precious child. This exchange could be interpreted as growing intimacy between the would-be lovers, but Carmilla's voice assumes a more maternal tone when she calls a young woman child. And Amy continues her narration. So as listeners, we're really confused about what exactly their relationship is based on just what we're hearing. The renamed general, who is now called General Skills, speaks with a German accent and is accompanied by a priest exorcist and a specialist in vampire lore. Intent on destroying Mercola, who believes is also a demon. They pry open the tomb, the doors of the tomb, evident in the sound of stones sliding across the stone, and they discover a barely alive Amy sleeping alongside Carmilla. Spielstorff uses a hammer and stakes Marcala. She audibly gasps, gasps and let out a blood curdling scream before dying. Many of these same sound effects and the same um, uh, the sound effects and the staking of the vampire. The uh, narration of, of Helen's journal. All of these these very same tropes are found in the earlier Dracula that was aired in 1938, that Orson Welles uh, was uh, played various parts. And so we hear a lot of the same things going on, just um, just brought into, of course, uh, you know, the the 1922 uh, is where the setting is. So these events are accompanied by dramatic music punctuated again with stingers, which really start to set the listener's nerves on end. As the drama concludes, the layered sounds of eerie music, violin music, Amy's, and Amy's voice um, all enhance her description of this haunted vision that she continues to see of Carmilla in her last minutes, um, quote, writing as a writing thing in the chapel, end quote. So ready to dramatizations of Carmilla demonstrate how well script writers use the aesthetics of sound to draw on listeners while also artfully avoiding taboo <coughs> subjects. In fact, the vampires liberated sexual desires were somewhat downplayed because they were contrary to the prescribed or even censored behaviors in society at the time. Moving forward to the COVID era podcast radio dramatization of Carmilla, I wanted to mention this even though it's, I don't consider it technically radio, but in this adaptation, um, it's described as a story about a battle between unnatural desires and the power of the divine, a physical and spiritual corruption of almost a demon in human form named Carmilla. I thought that was really interesting and another kind of place to go uh, do a little bit of research. American Radio, American Radio celebrated golden years span two of the most important decades in history. From the 30s to the post 40s, radio was the most important media next to the newspaper. Despite the obvious limitations of radio as an oral medium, dramatists and special effects artists managed to work with the strengths of this somewhat restrictive medium by incorporating narrative techniques and sophisticated and realistic sound effects to manipulate the listener's experience of the story. At the height of its popularity, radio proved to be innovative. Radio dramatists, tra dramatists intentionally gave place to emotional dimension, creating a suggestion of intimacy between the narrator, the character, and the listener, making this listening experience even more intense. A sound study scholar Christine Eric suggests in her analysis of the gender dimensions of sound, listening to these radio plays now, we remember that, quote, we are not the intended audience, end quote. 